tonight on CBC Vancouver News. As many as a third of your workforce at any one time may become ill with COVID-19. A warning for BC businesses to get ready for high absenteeism also. Being told we're doing well, and then yet here we are being closed down without any sort of like evidence as to why. Hoping for changes, gyms are disappointed they can't reopen and why home prices in some areas of the Fraser Valley have jumped more than 40%. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Well, in her first COVID-19 update of the year, the province's chief medical health officer has a warning for BC businesses. The coming weeks will be tough. High numbers of staff will likely be sick with the Omicron variant. Belle Puri is following the story and joins us live tonight. Belle, it sounds like Dr. Bonnie Henry is leaving it up to businesses to protect themselves. Pretty much. It seems like it's all up to us now. We know the rate of Omicron transmission is high. The incubation period is short. Far too many people are getting sick too fast. Today's message to businesses, reactivate your COVID-19 safety plans. The layers of protection that apply to your business. That's how to ensure you keep operating when huge numbers of the workforce are sick with the virus. Dr. Bonnie Henry anticipates that could be up to one third of staff at any given time. She says, we've been through this four times already. Businesses know what it takes to lower the risk of transmission, what steps need to be taken, and she wants to get out of giving orders. And yes, I do think it is over to the sector now. It's not me who can order these. It's, it's how we need to get through this new wave together. People who can work from home, she says, should do so. Those who have to go in should be offered staggered shifts and break times. Workplace masks and vaccines should be mandated. Okay, and Belle, speaking of masks, there's a lot of talk about masks amid this surge of Omicron and a lot of talk about which masks provide the best protection. What do we know? Well, some health officials say the best mask is the one that you're actually wearing. Others advocate for N95s to better achieve filtration of airborne particles. Dr. Henry says a good fitting mask with three layers is equally protective. I know some people have called for the increased use of, of respirators or N95s routinely. And I'll just say in the majority of settings, the incremental benefit in a low risk setting like a school or a retail store is minimal. What is most important is that you have a good fitting mask that you wear and you wear appropriately. Looking ahead over the next few weeks, Dr. Henry says everyone might not get sick, but everyone will be exposed to Omicron at some point. She also hopes this is the last time we have to start a new year focused on COVID-19. I think we definitely all hope for that, Val. Thank you. And BC is reporting more than 2,500 new cases of COVID-19 today. Four more people have died in the last 24 hours. Once again, the majority of new cases are from the Fraser Health region at nearly 1,500. At this rate, that health region is getting close to 13,000 active cases. The province is also reporting nine new outbreaks at healthcare facilities, four of them in Fraser Health, including Surrey Memorial. And now a total of 24 outbreaks are ongoing. Hospitalizations are also trickling up now at almost 300. That's a 35% increase from 220 last week. 86 of them are in intensive care. And BC's staggered back to school plan is in effect with children of essential workers and kids with special needs heading back to the class this week. But many questions still remain about how schools will enhance their measures against Omicron, including the deployment of N95 masks and rapid tests. BC's education minister says it's a matter of supply. What we are doing is ensuring that we have, that we've been in touch with our suppliers, that we have um, a good supply chain of the masks that we have been recommended to be providing in, uh, in the education system. Whiteside says they've been consulting with education stakeholders over the course of last month. She didn't go into specifics, but she says they're planning around more potential disruptive impacts on the school workforce. And tonight, Dr. Bonnie Henry is doubling down on keeping gyms closed. And this has owners outraged, demanding more data about why. 
A petition calling for gyms to be reopened now has more than 40,000 signatures. But Mira Baines tells us that's not leading to any changes. Gym owners across BC are demanding to see the data that's keeping them closed until at least January 18th. It's kind of this super confusing situation where it, we, we're just, you know, thinking we're doing well, even being told we're doing well. And then yet here we are being closed down without any sort of like evidence as to why. Or notice, really. A petition started by these Port Moody gym owners has more than 40,000 supporters. They, along with other fitness facilities, have filed freedom of information requests as well. This is unjust and without any data to back that up, and that's why the outrage. Even so, BC health officials say they're not planning on removing restrictions as COVID cases across the province continue to rise fast. And when we have a lot of transmission in our community, we have repeatedly seen the gyms become amplifiers. And we've had a number of examples of that that we put out information on. Early on in the pandemic, there were 42 cases of COVID-19 at Platinum Athletics in Surrey. And in Ontario, a super spreader event happened at a Hamilton spin studio, hit with 72 cases of COVID. However, headway has been made with more people double vaccinated and boosters. But there are still concerns the virus will spread from younger active people to those more vulnerable. So while I may not have, and certainly right now, I can't tell you every single case that's been linked to a gym, but we can tell you that, there, that we've seen this as a pattern, um, that these are environments that are higher risk. The fitness community is concerned about people's well-being. Many clients say they feel gym and mental health go hand in hand. Some fitness facilities, including Iron Energy Gym in West Kelowna, are posting on social media and defying the orders by opening. Provincial Health Officer Dr. Bonnie Henry thanked gyms and fitness studios for complying with public health orders. But those business owners want to know ahead of time whether these restrictions will last beyond January 18th. Mira Baines, CBC News, Victoria. Okay, time to talk weather. Most of the province is getting hit with yet again a blast of winter. Several weather alerts are in effect across BC in Metro Vancouver. Heavy snow fell this afternoon, leading to some significant traffic delays. Isabel Regem is live in downtown Vancouver tonight. Isabel, uh, it doesn't look like it's falling as hard as it was a little while ago for you. No, that's right. The heavy snowfall has come to an end. It's eased somewhat, but in the last half hour or so, it's picked back up uh, slightly on and off uh, in the last half hour, hour or so. Uh, but even though that snowfall, that heavy snowfall, uh, the size, the snowflakes were sizes of loonies, even though that's come to an end, the road conditions are still very slick. There's a lot of slush on the ground, and in some areas, we're seeing black ice as well. Now, let's take a look at some of the images from earlier this afternoon. This was shot by CB sees Ian Hannah Mansing in Vancouver and those were conditions early around 4 p.m. and we saw this um, up and down the coast several areas across Vancouver also seeing these kind of road conditions with cars car tires spinning and struggling to make it making it up slopes um, and let's also take a look at the Canby Street Bridge this was uh, tweeted by Vancouver's police chief showing bumper to bumper traffic um, with snow coming down uh, downtown Vancouver and heading into downtown, the Canby Street Bridge uh, completely slowed down and visibility was also reduced. Let's take a look also at some images that we have on social media shared uh, with us of some of those driving conditions that's leading some of the police forces to ask drivers, be careful and stay off the roads, especially if you don't have winter tires. Now let's take a look at Port Alberni on Vancouver Island. Uh, we've received a, a photo of an apparent snowplow being flipped over on its side off the side of a road. It was taken just outside of uh, Port Alberni at Sprout Lake, and we don't have many details of what happened and the condition of the driver. We have made several calls. Uh, we will keep you posted once we get an update. And the snowfall also impacting public transit, including the bus route to Burrard Station and SFU on Burnaby Mountain. Uh, we're also seeing TransLink uh, warning delays of several bus routes, up to 60 min or minutes delays. Uh, so you're being asked to check with TransLink 
Catholic um, online or on the phone to have any updates. And a reminder, warming centers are also being kept open across municipalities in Metro Vancouver. Uh, if you need any details, you can visit the website or call 311 for some details. And Anita, the thing here is that there is a lot more snow on its way. We have a winter storm watch in effect for the south coast tomorrow evening. So this isn't the last of it, and we've got a lot more on its way, and I'm sure Joe will give us all the details shortly. But before we leave you, we have some images of some British Columbians making the most of the snow uh, yesterday. Take a look at this. This is at a ferry terminal, a group making Frosty the Snowmen uh, enjoying a time lapse of the snow and making the most of it. And with a lot more snow in the forecast, we are sure to be seeing a lot more frosties being built in the days to come. Anita? Absolutely, Isabel. Thank you. And uh, get inside, get dry. Yes, yes, thanks. And while the rest of Nelson continues to dig out from the recent massive snowfall, one local man took on the challenge to make a winter wonderland. Take a look. Blowit resident Brad Poman tackled the nearly 80 centimeters with his trusty snowblower, and he didn't stop at the driveway. Poman made trails around his home and through the yard for the neighborhood kids. But it's not all fun in town. Residential garbage and recycling pickup is canceled this week because of Sunday's snowfall. And meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff is here now with a closer look at what's happening tonight and what's to come. And there is a lot more, as we heard from Isabel. This is uh, the warm-up, if you will, and it was quite the warm-up. A couple things happened today. I know temperatures were forecast to hover around 2 degrees for most of Metro Vancouver. Uh, we had the Arctic outflow move in uh, a little quicker from the valley outwards, so temperatures are dropping much faster. And also, as the rainfall rates became quite heavy through the day, or quite intense, actually dragging down cooler air, so many people seeing snow uh, that uh, was going to be rain for most of the day. Okay, let me show you what things look like on the satellite and radar because that main event has moved off, but we're still seeing precip fill in on the satellite and radar. It is snowing uh, out in Surrey where Isabel is. It is snowing up here in North Van, and we're seeing that precip scattered right across the south coast. So we could pick up a couple more centimeters overnight tonight. The next main event, though, there's that low. That's the one that'll move in tomorrow evening, and that's the one that we have had winter storm watches in place uh, for uh, over 24 hours now. This is going to be an even bigger event uh, than the one most of Metro Vancouver has been hit with. That being said, I think North Van picked up about 10 to 20 centimeters this afternoon. We could see uh, 10 to 20 centimeters for all of Metro Vancouver beginning tomorrow late afternoon, falling through the overnight and into Thursday morning before changing over to rain. This one is bringing milder air behind it. We also have special weather statements all the way out through the southern interior for 25 centimeters to the tops of the passes. The valley bottom will see 10 to 20, and the west side of the island, even Tofino inland, uh, picking up some snow. And you can see that Arctic uh, outflow and the extreme cold warning still in place to the north. So we'll take you through that lingering shower, snow showers over the next couple of hours. Uh, I think by 5, 6, 7 a.m. Be prepared for a couple fresh centimeters on the road tomorrow. Anita, I'll be back to really time out the next storm. Uh, basically, uh, in some cases, double what we've seen today. Oh, wow. Okay, well, I definitely need that minute by minute, so I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. The weather update is brought to you by Sophia Financial Group of Raymond James Limited. Register now for our free cash flow connection series at sophiaevents.ca. <laughs> Well, the pandemic had people on the move in 2021, the impact sending home values in some of BC's suburbs skyrocketing. Chilliwack saw the sharpest increase in the Fraser Valley with assessed values up 40 percent. Delta, Surrey, Abbotsford and Langley all saw increases of more than 30 percent. According to BC assessment, Vancouver saw the lower mainland's smallest increase with the value of a single family home up 16 percent. Now, things got a little crazier on Vancouver Island. Home values jumped the highest in Port Alberni up 47 percent. The market has definitely changed since COVID, um, and you know maybe it's it's been something around wanting to live uh, somewhere where you could raise your family and have space and it's affordable. 
Changes to property assessments don't automatically translate into increases in property taxes. It really depends on how your property rises compared to those around you. And property owners do have until January 31st to appeal those notice of assessments. An historic settlement, the details on a $40 billion agreement to support those impacted by an underfunded First Nations child welfare system. That's next. Thanks for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. Now, when the thermometer drops like it has here in BC, heading outside may not be an inviting option, and that includes for some dogs. That said, the furry family members still need exercise and playtime. So here are some creative ways people are delivering that. So when the weather's cold, we have to switch our focus from going for walks, uh, which may not be appropriate for a lot of dogs, to doing enrichment and activities in a smaller enclosed space. It's too cold. She would just sit down. She's so stubborn, she doesn't want to go out at all. So that's why we come here, like to the dog house. It's amazing. We went out and bought a cheap $300 Walmart treadmill. She showed how to do it and they walked for a while with the lead and then we took the lead off and they would get on there on their own. Everyone was like, of course you put your dog in the treadmill. I'm like, well, it's healthy for them. Like I gotta keep, gotta keep them healthy and occupied and stimulated because that's the thing about dogs is they need to be stimulated, right? They're just happy to be moving. There's so many do-it-yourself, handy little things that you can do um, just with the stuff that you might have on hand in your home. Oh, here we go. She's a 50-pound golden doodle, and she thinks she's five pounds in a lap dog. So I could put her booties on and put her jacket on, but realistically, it's not safe for her to be out with her lungs. So we just tried to come up with different ways to keep her entertained indoors. Come get it. Come see. So the food just comes spilling out eventually and she'll, she'll kind of knock them and then she has to go and chase them. So it took her quite a while to kind of figure that out, but she still loves playing it. She'll play it for ages. And it's how I actually feed her her lunch and dinner. It stimulates her mind. We've been very carefully sussing out businesses that allow pets. So Things like Winners, uh, Rona, Home Depot, uh, a lot of the greenhouses actually allow you to walk through with your pets as long as they're well behaved on a leash. Oh my goodness, he just lives outside. He's loving this minus 40 and most dogs pick up their paws, don't want to go outside and we'll, we'll spend two hours outside and it's not long enough for him. <laughs> The federal government and Indigenous leaders have announced a $40 billion agreement. It includes compensation for First Nations people harmed by underfunding in the child welfare system. As Olivia Stefanovic tells us, this will be the largest financial settlement of its kind in Canadian history. It's a day Ashley Bach has waited for her whole life. I'm really excited and hopeful. Recognition of the harm caused by being taken away from her family and culture at birth. Like there's so much that could come out of this that'll help people reclaim their identities. After nearly two months of intense negotiations, the federal government is offering $40 billion to correct the wrongs of the past and fix the system so they aren't repeated. This is the largest 
settlement in Canadian history. But no amount of money can reverse the harms experienced by First Nations children. However, historic injustices require historic reparations. $20 billion to compensate First Nations children on reserve and in the Yukon, who were removed from their homes over the past 31 years, along with their parents and caregivers, and any child denied services under a policy known as Jordan's Principle. I acknowledge your pain and your loss, the loss of time, and, a fam and family life with your siblings. I'm sorry you didn't, didn't have that. No, we're going to do it together. Another $20 billion is being set aside for long-term reform, including support for youth aging out of care and an independent review of Indigenous Services Canada to make sure the department doesn't discriminate against another generation of children. We need to commit ourselves to keeping watch on the government of Canada and holding it accountable until it lands some of these things. The parties have agreed to negotiate until the end of March. The agreement then needs to be approved by the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal and federal court before it's finalized. Only after those steps can compensation start to flow to tens of thousands of people. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. And as Canada continues to attempt to right the wrongs against Indigenous people, many requests for compensation still leave it up to the individual to prove their experience. Freelance journalist Tara Roche brings us the story of a Mi'kmaq woman from Nova Scotia who had to chase down documents all the way to the U.S. Debbie Paul visits the site where the Shubenacadie Residential School once stood. When it closed in 1967, she was the last Mi'kmaq student to leave. Paul is 12 years old in this photo, unaware her life was about to take an incredible turn. They took me. They took me without permission. They crossed the border. A nun with the Sisters of Charity Halifax took Paul to the States without consent and abandoned her with the nun's brother and family. What would you call, like, what she did in terms of taking you and putting you on a plane and bringing you to Rockland, how, what do you call it? Theft. Theft. Paul went from the residential school to the 60 Scoop, a practice of removing Indigenous kids from their families, communities and cultures and putting them in foster care or up for adoption. She filed for compensation under the settlement agreement with Canada. I think I deserve it to live the end of my life because I went through hell. But neither the Canadian government nor the Sisters of Charity have any record of what happened. Paul's compensation claim was rejected. Please send us more information on the length of time and location of your placement. I did that and I have no proof, none, no records, they have no records. She appealed, but now needs proof, and she can't find it in Canada. But today, I feel good. Going, going there to get my records. Paul chases a paper trail all the way to Rockland, Massachusetts. Months ago, she called, looking for her elementary school records here, without luck. But when a CBC Investigates team got involved, an administrator dug through old boxes in their vault. Oh my God, I got my school records. Let's see. Finally, proof. She was under the guardianship of the nun's brother and his wife. This proves everything. This little piece of paper. Wow. I matter. <laughs> I matter. Paul arrives back home in Mi'kma'ki. She hopes her school records are enough for compensation as a 60 scoop survivor but she says the onus shouldn't be on her to chase down records. Reconciliation doesn't start with me. Reconciliation starts with you. You open those books. You open that material. Nearly 8,000 claims are currently being assessed. Almost half require more information. Paul hopes her story helps others. I'm here today. I matter. This is what happened to me. And you know what? You matter. You as an individual, you matter. For CBC News, I'm Trina Roach in Okjibokdok, also known as Halifax. If you or someone you know is looking for support, you can reach the National Residential School Crisis Line 
at 1-866-925-4419. It operates 24 hours and is available for anyone impacted by the lingering effects of residential schools and anyone who's been triggered by the topic. Turning to COVID now, some hospitals in this country are already approaching a breaking point with a new rush of Omicron cases. That includes people arriving for COVID treatment and others who showed up for unrelated reasons and tested positive on site. As Thomas Degla shows us, hospital staff are simply overwhelmed. For the second time since the start of the pandemic, troops are again on the ground in Quebec, helping now with the vaccination effort. Hospitals don't have the staff to spare. We have to, uh, to act very rapidly. We want to preserve our, our capacity. With thousands of healthcare staff isolating or otherwise away from work, Quebec is the latest province to limit who can get a PCR test and reduce the isolation time for suspected cases to as little as five days. You can't run a large hospital when so many people can't show up, you know, so you can see where the expediency comes in, but it certainly is not a zero risk endeavor. New Brunswick says 571 healthcare workers are isolating at home as officials coast to coast expect more staff shortages. We're going to face considerable staff challenges with this much COVID-19 in the community. Two Toronto area hospitals have activated a so-called code orange, urgently cutting services so staff can be reassigned to deal with COVID. Nurses were being stretched too thin. We like it to be one to four, one nurse for every four patients or one nurse to every five patients. And we were getting close to one to 10 and we felt that that was not safe. In Ontario, case counts are reaching levels that were unimaginable just days ago. With testing restricted, experts can only estimate. What probably happens is that we only diagnose one in five cases, meaning these 20,000 are more like 100,000 already. And although only a small percentage will need critical care, already the impact in hospital brings this nurse to tears. Because we have people with surgeries that are cancelled, heart surgeries are cancelled, cancer surgeries are cancelled. People at the bedside are suffering. Nurses are breaking down. That's the CBC's Thomas Dagla reporting tonight. Now, the U.S. is also dealing with an explosive surge of COVID-19 cases after the holidays. More than one million new infections reported just yesterday. As Katie Nicholson explains, the biggest concern right now is record hospitalizations. An endless stream of cars all lining up for this important poke in the nose to test for COVID-19. While in Connecticut, the National Guard rolls out home testing kits. Almost one in 100 Americans have tested positive for COVID in the last week, according to Johns Hopkins University. And the CDC says Omicron now accounts for 95% of U.S. cases. In Maryland, among the worst hit states, the governor declared a 30-day state of emergency. The next four to six weeks will be the most challenging time of the entire pandemic. That's one of the reasons President Biden announced he's doubling the U.S. order for Pfizer's antiviral pills to 20 million, the biggest order in the world. They're a game changer and have the potential to dramatically alter the impact of COVID-19, the impact it's had on this country and our people. Across the country, the Omicron variant is also driving a record-breaking rise in pediatric cases, putting a strain on parents. I just hope that, you know, he's able to get better and go home. And the strain on hospitals is worrying pediatricians. COVID in a very short period of time has become one of the leading medical causes of death for children in this country. So I think it's about time that we stopped downplaying the significance of COVID for children. Hoping to contain the spread, schools in big cities like Atlanta, Milwaukee and Cleveland moved temporarily to remote learning. In Chicago, the teachers union making the case their schools should also go remote. The mitigations are not in place here. The communication is not in place here. Um, our, our mayor, quite frankly, is failing our students and we want a plan that looks like, that sounds like safety. 
And in another bid to control the burgeoning numbers, the CDC had hinted it might change its new isolation guidance. Tonight, only a minor tweak, suggesting if on the fifth day of isolation a person happens to have a rapid test and if it comes back positive, that person should continue isolating. Just a soft suggestion, not a hard rule. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Washington. A U.S. federal judge is deciding whether a civil case against Prince Andrew can proceed. Virginia Jufre claims the Duke of York sexually assaulted her when she was a teen 20 years ago. As Far Morale explains, the decision rests on how the judge will interpret the wording of the settlement reached back in 2009. At the heart of this case, the night this photo was captured, 17-year-old Virginia Jufre pictured with Prince Andrew. In a civil suit, Jufre claims she was flown to London by Jeffrey Epstein and now convicted sex trafficker Ghislaine Maxwell and forced to have sex with the prince. Claims he is denied through his lawyers and publicly in a rare 2019 interview with the BBC. I don't remember meeting her at all. Today, lawyers for the prince argued the case should be tossed because of a settlement Jufre already reached with Epstein in 2009. The details of that were recently made public. Epstein agreed to pay her $500,000 to drop the case, and Jufre agreed to release and forever discharge any other person who could have been included as a potential defendant from all actions. It really will come down to how the judge interprets those two words, potential defendant. While the prince's lawyers argued that means he's excluded from liability, this legal expert says the judge didn't seem convinced. But you could tell um, that Judge Kaplan was skeptical about whether that stands up in law just because of, you know, the consequences of a clause like that. The judge said he'll release his decision very soon. It's one the royal family will be watching closely. Well, certainly there's no good outcome uh, for him here. Royal commentators say even if the case is dismissed, It'll likely be on a technicality, leading to further today. blowback. And he'll be perceived to have been uh, dodging the bullet uh, thanks to a, a rather sleazy agreement signed by a convicted, uh, convicted um, paedophile. Platinum Jubilee celebrations are set to begin for the Queen this year. The looming legal decision involving her son now threatens to cast a dark shadow over the festive mood. Farah Morali, CBC News, London. As Omicron surges, what is the impact on the young, the unvaccinated children under five and the undervaccinated five to 11? We speak live with pediatric specialist, Dr. Srinivas Murthy coming up. Around this time, thousands of people swear that this is the year they're going to give up smoking. It's not easy, and a lot of people don't make it. But would be non smokers are getting a lot more help these days than they used to. Anti smoking campaigns are taking off across the country, especially in the cities. So, to find out more about what's behind this new development, we sent Larry Stout on assignment for Saturday Report. Good to see you. It's happening more often than ever at private parties. After a warm greeting, a polite admonition. No smoking, please. Yeah. Oh, I'm really sorry. That's but okay. With so many people. I'll survive. Home. I didn't bring my kite. The sign on the front door says it all. <laughs> Considerations of health aside, smokers in Canada, already a minority, are under enormous social pressure to butt out. I find many people coming to me to get help stopping smoking, and they, they say, well, you know, I know about the health pressures, the health issues. I'm not particularly worried about it. Uh, I want to stop because nobody else at the office smokes anymore, and I feel strange the way they look at me when I smoke, and they cite this as, a, as, a, as the reason they want to stop, and I think it's a powerful reason. When Esther Lewis held a party at her Toronto home, she agonized over asking her guests not to smoke. We didn't like to make an arbitrary decision. We're not used to doing it to our friends or to anyone for that matter, but we thought it was important. And Esther Lewis's guests observed the smoking ban. Some puffed on the porch, others just persevered. 
not all without complaint. So I don't like to be told what not to do. I keep my pipe in my purse. It's not lit because I'm obeying orders. Obey indeed. Smokers are becoming more and more isolated by law. Smoking is already banned in many public buildings and on some short-haul airline flights. Smoking has been voluntarily banned in many factories and offices, including the CBC's National Television Newsroom, where smokers must inhale in isolation. Vancouver already has the country's toughest no-smoking laws in the workplace, and Toronto may soon follow its example. Bars and restaurants in most Canadian cities must now have designated no-smoking areas. And you can even find some restaurants where smoking isn't allowed at all. The owner of this small dining room in Ottawa says the no-smoking policy has been very successful. Most people are happy enough to go for a little while with a cigarette, but, I mean, we've had... We've been open a year and a half, and we've had about five people who sort of got excited about it. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Extreme cold and an Arctic outflow warnings have returned to many areas of British Columbia, and the falling snow is already affecting our roads in Metro Vancouver. Buses are delayed and traffic has been at a standstill in many spots. The snow plow even flipped off the road outside Port Alberni. The value of homes is skyrocketing in many Metro Vancouver cities. Chilliwack has seen the steepest increase in the Fraser Valley, with assessed values up 40 percent. Surrey, Coquitlam, Delta, Langley and Abbotsford all saw increases of more than 30 percent. And on Vancouver Island, homes in Port Alberni went up 47 percent. It's not about public health orders and us telling you what to do. This is about activating all of those layers of protection available for your business in your situation to keep you from having to shut down because you don't have enough people to operate. Well, BC businesses are being warned to prepare for as much as a third of the workforce to be out because of COVID-19. Dr. Bonnie Henry asking businesses to put all plans in place to mitigate the staffing issues that may come up including equipping people to work from home. Now, in Alberta, officials have confirmed the death of a child from COVID-19. And in the U.S., there's been a spike in young COVID patients. So are we seeing more concern around whether kids are facing more risk now here with the spread of Omicron? What's the reality here in Canada? For more on this, we have Clinical Professor of Pediatrics at UBC, Dr. Srinivas Murthy, joining us live tonight. Thanks for being with us. Hi again, Anita. What are we seeing in our hospitals when it comes to kids now? Has Omicron changed anything like it has in the U.S.? Yeah, of course. With uh, the number of cases in our community right now, of course, there are going to be more kids who are infected and more kids who are admitted to hospital. And we're seeing that across the country with many kids being admitted. Um, we're not seeing as many ICU admissions as they are in the United States, and that's due to a variety of factors. Um, a lot of it is related to the number of vaccinated individuals we have in our country and also, I guess, the number of healthy kids we have in our communities. I personally am hearing of many more kids under five getting infected. Most are reporting high fever, lots of congestion. Uh, do you foresee this continuing and should people take their little ones to the hospital in this case? Yeah, it's the same warning signs that you would have for any other infection that you have in your young one. Um, so if they're acting unwell, if they're really feverish, then have them checked out. Um, but we will see more cases in that under five age range, particularly because they're the ones who are not vaccinated. So when you see them in hospital, what uh, sort of symptoms are they coming in with? Like what makes that more severe than your typical fever and congestion at home? It's typically requiring oxygen. And so children who are having trouble breathing and require oxygen just to get them through the infection are the ones that would be typically admitted to hospital. 
Okay, we had a doctor on yesterday who said she doesn't believe schools should be delayed this week here in BC and for more weeks in other parts of the country, and that the mental health of kids is suffering a lot more than the worry about kids getting sick from COVID. Now, that interview prompted a lot of backlash. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, schools are, are a tricky one, obviously. I think we need to make sure we strike balance between kids getting sick and the benefits of school. And so keeping schools as safe as possible should really be our goal. We know that children will have a large rate of infections um, with this wave, given their vaccination status and given the number of cases. Trying to protect them as much as possible in schools where they will be together um, should be our goal. I agree that schools are so important with, for kids right now. Now, when can we expect vaccines for kids under five? Yeah, that's probably a little ways away. The trials are still underway, um, and Pfizer and Moderna are working very hard at getting those vaccines up and running, um, not for the next few months at the very earliest. It's been a hard year, Dr. Murthy, and I think it's safe to say people are really feeling down. Is there any hope in all of this? Yeah, of course, all pandemics end. Um, and hopefully it's in the near term rather than the long term. We're seeing a lot of cases right now in our communities and hopefully um, it's a spike up and a spike down um, as they're seeing in South Africa. We might have a different situation in Canada, but hopefully we'll see over the next few weeks. All right, Dr. Srinivas Murthy, thanks for being with us. Take care. For 15 years, she's run a sanctuary for older and sick animals in Messino. Everything from dogs to cows. Why Caroline Hine is stepping away and who is stepping up. That's next. At 6.39, a live look at Rebel Stoke completely blanketed in a thick layer of snow. Cold, crisp conditions throughout the province. Johanna has her full forecast coming up. there, Janae. <laughs> oh no, what happened to your arm? Oh, <laughs> that's just the bandage from my vaccine. Oh, <laughs> phew. <laughs> Wait a minute, what's a vaccine? Oh, a vaccine is medicine that teaches our bodies how to fight off germs that could make us sick. I just got my first shot today. Oh, a shot? No, thank you. <laughs> well, shots can be a little scary. But it didn't hurt much, and I got this cool sticker afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like stickers, but I definitely don't like shots. Plus, I don't feel sick at all, so, so I probably don't need one. Well, I'm glad that you feel well. That's actually the best time to get a vaccine. Vaccines help keep us from getting sick in the first place. Mm, I sure don't like being sick. I have to stay home, and I can't play with any of my friends. Well, getting the vaccine is a great way to be a good friend. If you don't get sick, then you can't pass the germs on to your friends. And then you all can keep playing together. Hmm. I never thought about it like that. I'm going to go get the vaccine, too. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, Gary. Uh, but, Janae, do you think you could hold my hoof if I get scared? Oh, of course I will. We'll go together. Oh, well, I am going to be so brave, I'm going to get 50 stickers. <laughs> Yeah, one for my horn, and one, one for my hoof, and then for the other hoof. Oh, and then three for my sweater. Come on, Gary. I'm coming. If becoming a scientist has taught me anything, it's that experiments often fail. And for me, cooking is one giant experiment in the kitchen. I'm Anthony Morgan. I'm a molecular research scientist, and I am not much of a cook. So I'm turning to some of the world's top culinary experts. I am an ice cream scientist. I have a PhD in mashed potatoes. To find out why science is the secret recipe. Buzz it up. To becoming a better home chef. Having a better understanding of the science that you use in cooking makes you cook smarter. On the menu, appetizers, entrees, sides, and desserts. Mm as these master chefs reveal inside tips yeah. to help us sharpen our kitchen skills with sizzling chemistry. Molecular orgy. <laughs> Mouth-watering microbes. The yeast is like woo-hee. The power of heat. That is one red-hot chili pepper. 
and frozen perfection. I have the coolest job in the world. So preheat your oven as we cook up some scrumptious science. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Enjoy groundbreaking contemporary works of theater, dance, music, and multimedia at the PUSH International Performing Arts Festival running January 20th to February 6th. Get tickets at pushfestival.ca and never miss a special programming series or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver Inbox and keep connected with us. An 11-year-old girl from Cody First Nation in Saskatchewan is celebrating today. Isabella Kulak was shamed by a school staff member last December after wearing a traditional ribbon dress for formal day. That attracted national attention. And as Bonnie Allen explains, it also sparked change. When 11-year-old Isabella Kulak from Cody First Nation put on her traditional ribbon skirt this morning, once she sewed herself... She felt like a superhero, ready for her school's first annual Ribbon Skirt Day. The Ribbon Skirt represents to me strength, resilience and womanhood. Last winter, Kulak was excited to wear her Ribbon Skirt to formal day at her Kamsak school. But then an educational assistant made her feel ashamed, saying her outfit didn't match and that she should dress like other girls. That I could wear something else like a store-bought dress. Her great aunt Judy Pelly shared the story on Facebook and women around the world donned ribbon skirts in solidarity. I'm extremely, extremely proud of her because she came, she's, she's been a catalyst for change across the world. Uh, her bravery and her resilience has caused uh, a movement across the, the globe. I've apologized personally to Bella's parents and to Bella herself. The director of education was quick to apologize last year, calling it an example of systemic racism and declaring January 4th Ribbon Skirt Day, a day for students to celebrate their culture and uniqueness. We're going to have a smudge and pray and it's going to be a good day. Kulak's mother has also been hired by the school division as an Indigenous community worker. Actually, I'm working at the school now, and we've started a ribbon skirt class, and we're getting into beading and a drum group, and the sky's the limit, and everything's going great. Other girls and women across Canada also wore their traditional skirts today, and a Manitoba senator has sponsored a bill to make January 4th a national ribbon skirt day. It's pretty cool. The bill has already received second reading in the Senate. Well, this beautiful little girl, uh, you know, helped change the world. On this day, Kulak says she feels respected and understood. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. Let's check in once again with meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff, who is nice and dry now. Uh, Joe, it was definitely a beautiful dump today as it was happening and now looking outside pretty soggy and dare I say ugly. <laughs> you can, I would use that word, Anita. Yeah, we've got a lot going on out there. It was wet, heavy snow for much of Metro Vancouver. You know, I was uh, standing out in snow drifts in North Vancouver. They're now up to my knees and we could be talking, you know, over a meter of snow, uh, fresh snow on the ground when all is said and done and sport changes over to rain. Thursday afternoons. We have a lot more to get through. I want to show you the current temperatures out there, sort of painting the picture of what's happening right now. We do have some stray uh, precip bands moving in from the southwest. Temperatures hovering around uh, one at YVR, so anything falling overnight, and we may get a couple more centimeters, will be falling as snow. That Arctic air now entrenched through the valley, minus eight out towards Hope and Victoria, hanging on to that other air mass we were battling with earlier today out of four. Okay, taking you through the timing. The purple is the snow, the uh, pink is the rain snow line, which has been very hard to nail down. Taking you through the overnight into tomorrow morning, here's five, six, seven, eight a.m. 
uh, we may still see some lingering uh, wet snow for the morning commute. We don't get much of a break mid-morning. It's afternoon hours that we'll see that next big storm fill in. So for the commute home tomorrow afternoon, expect heavy snow falling from the sky and accumulating on the ground for Metro Vancouver. Even down towards the Greater Victoria area, you'll be seeing that switch over just snow through the evening hours, widespread snow right through to Thursday pre-dawn hours. Now this model has it switching over to rain quite early. I think it's going to take quite a while for that warm air to uh, filter down the atmosphere. So I'd expect snow through Thursday morning as well before changing over to rain in the afternoon. And uh, we'll be updating you on that timing tomorrow. But a quick look at the snowfall totals through to Thursday morning, that's a good 10 to 20 centimeters from Metro Vancouver and possibly more like 20 to 40 as we head out towards the valley. So big snow event coming again tomorrow afternoon through to Thursday before it does change over to rain. And we are going to get that warmer air filter in for Thursday afternoon. Friday, we'll catch a bit of a break. It looks like it's another rain snow mix on Saturday at Anita. Big pattern change after what has been three weeks of this Arctic air battling uh, will come Sunday. We'll talk more about that then. Yeah, that looks pretty nice at the end of all that rain mm -hmm. snow. We'll take it. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. It's a place that helps old and sick animals that others have abandoned. Saints, or the Senior Animals in Need Today Society, is located in Mission, and it's been saving everything from dogs to cows for more than 15 years. But now the Society's founder is retiring and handing over the reins to a new director. This is our memorial garden. 30 to 50 animals will end their lives here every year. Um, we're obviously very attached to them and when they pass away, we hang a wind chime for them and then we paint their names on a rock. Every animal has the potential to find a home. The animals that are deemed unadoptable through other shelters, it's because their care needs are too great to be able to find them that perfect home within a reasonable time frame. I really believe that mankind has lost its value of service and that, you know, if we want our lives to be meaningful, then we need to be of service to something or someone. I chose my nursing career and I chose caring for seniors and special needs animals. When I first started Saints, it was just me. I walked onto a private property with 30 animals and wasn't sure what was going to happen. And then people just started joining me along the way. Saints was built by volunteers and the volunteer component here is huge. Back in 2007, that's when we hired our first staff. Everybody brings something special here, whether it's a certain kind of knowledge or a skill, but the one thing everybody has in common is their dedication to animals, their love for animals, their respect for animals. We generally have on site anywhere from 100 to 130 animals. And that includes, you know, little Donatello, our turtle, to our chickens and our quail and our budgies and the horses and cows and horse, dogs, cats. And then we usually have about 50 animals out in permanent foster care where they get to live in a home and they're loved and they're well cared for and we cover their medical expenses, which is one of the biggest barriers to, you know, senior or sick animals finding homes. Emily came in as a one day old calf. She's called the Free Martin, which means that she's uh, sterile, not good for the dairy industry. She is the kindest, gentlest cow on the face of the earth. This is Lisa, and Lisa loves people. She had an injury where she fractured her vertebrae along the top of her shoulders, and uh, she's not good for riding anymore. Nova lost her home when she was five months old because she couldn't be house trained. Her family didn't realize that she had a bladder infection and that's why she couldn't be house trained.
The whole retirement issue came up because I am getting older and it's a good time to be making the transition. Saints is on a good track. Um, we have great people that are here that can carry us forward. Carol put a wonderful foundation in here at Saints. Moving forward, we're going to continue to grow the organization through education about the importance of care for those special needs and that they do have a purpose and that you can care for them. And then also increasing uh, supporters and space. The more support we have, the more animals that we can save. When I created Saints, I wanted a place where the animals who didn't necessarily fit in had a place where they did fit, where they were loved, where they were accepted. That transposes animal. People can look at the animals here who have lived difficult lives, who might not be the nicest animals. Maybe they bite, uh, maybe they have behavioral issues, but we accept them and we still see their value. And I want that to transpose over into our neighbors and our co-workers and you know we need to open our minds and if we can start with the animals maybe we can open it larger to include the rest of humanity too. A message of hope, star poet Shane Coizan's inspiring message as we enter the second year of the pandemic. That's next. She's come so far, so fast. Cynthia Appiah winning silver in the women's monobob last month, her first World Cup medal as a pilot. Oh, I'm so excited. We're well, World Cup medal! Woo! Yes. Next up, her sights firmly set on the Winter Games. You have to put in 100% uh, to be able to, you know, achieve your goals. That's something Appia was taught from an early age. Her parents immigrated from Ghana, raising their family in Toronto community housing. They prioritized education and hard work. I just see how hard they have worked to be able to give us like what we needed in life, to make sure that we put every effort into, or put our best effort into everything that we did. Um, and for that, I'm, I'm very grateful. Fastest starter. That lesson served her well. Appia got into bobsleigh after being a track and field athlete at York University. She's built for both, strong and fast. But in 2018, a major disappointment. I was just like ready to call it quits. After years of hard work and sacrifice, she was told she'd be an alternate at the 2018 Games. She was about to quit, but instead pressed on, moving from her position as a brake woman to the driver's seat as a pilot. The way she then turned that disappointment into a positive energy and a, a resolute determination, you know, to push forward and to, you know, to, to make it to this next game uh, has, has been admirable. Meanwhile, Appia stayed connected to Toronto, giving back to her community, staying close with her family. So it's just really inspiring to see. Her sister Martha and the rest of her family are her biggest fans. She's always been the person who try, tries anything, always wants to kind of push herself, pushes us as well to do our best. So. 592, she again. could possibly not go quicker. Through it all, Appia says she's had to deal with negative stereotypes, being a black athlete in a winter sport. I find that it just makes it that much more sweeter when it, when I am successful. I don't see myself as really being, you know, um, this huge figure in anything. Like, I just feel like my presence is um, enough to kind of show that the possibilities are endless. For advice to others with big dreams? It's going to be difficult. Like, I don't want to stand here and pretend like it's been sunshine and rainbows. But know that, you know, your determination and the tenacity that you have and the passion that you have within yourself is what's going to help you to become stronger. You will get there. Just like Appia. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto.
A dog famous for an incredible rescue has been rescued again. Mila, a Jindo mix, has been missing from its Kelowna home since November 19th. But rescuers from Canine Recovery Services were able to catch the wayward pup on Sunday. Now, this isn't the first solo adventure for Mila. Mila was last seen rescued from a deserted island in Korea in June. Her rescue was broadcast on Korean TV and has been watched millions of times. Okay, a New Year's video with a message of post-pandemic hope from spoken word poet Shane Koizan. In a touching piece titled Tomorrow, Koizan reflects on the events since the start of the pandemic and looks forward to new beginnings. Take a look. There will be graduation and prom. There will be powwows and pride. Diwali, Burning Man and Glastonbury. It will be each other. It will be family. It will be friends. Mark your calendars. Because there will be a tomorrow when today finally ends. We're all looking forward to that for sure. That's our show for January 4th. Thanks for being with us tonight and we'll see you back here tomorrow.